There's so much in the news, especially around the environment, around the topic of refrigerants. So we've heard a lot about how refrigerants can cause global warming, how refrigerants can damage the stratospheric ozone over the years. But what are refrigerants in the first place? Some of the earliest refrigerants just used evaporation to remove heat off of an object or a surface. One of the most common is water. Water, when it evaporates and those molecules are freed of their bonds, brings some heat with it. That's what we call an open system. So the heat actually moves away. The refrigerant, in this case water, leaves never to return. But in order for a refrigeration or air conditioning system to be practical and to be repeatable, we have to create a closed loop system. And this is where modern refrigerants come in. So first, a quick history lesson. Back in 1758, Benjamin Franklin and John Hadley did some experiments on the cooling power of evaporation using ether and alcohol. It doesn't need to be a very complicated experiment to know that if you take rubbing alcohol or isopropyl alcohol, put it on your hands, rub it together, you'll notice that you get a cooling effect. It's basically the same effect that you get with water, but it creates a more intense cooling effect in the case of alcohol and ether because they're more volatile substances with a lower boiling point, meaning that they want to evaporate more easily than water does. In 1823, Michael Faraday, who also did a lot of experiments with electricity, electromagnetism, chemistry, demonstrated a cooling effect by evaporating ammonia and other molecules. In 1834, Jacob Perkins, who's often called the father of the refrigerator, actually created one of the first closed loop systems that had a refrigerating effect. Now, some of you may say, hey, I thought you said John Gorey was the guy who did that. Well, John Gorey was the first one to do it at low enough temperatures to actually create ice and to create a system that did something practical. And again, he did that in 1842 in an effort to care for his patients. After Perkins and Gorey, we were really off to the races with refrigerants. And some of the first refrigerants that people used were ammonia, which is highly corrosive and highly toxic, still used today, methyl chloride, which is flammable and toxic, and then sulfur dioxide, which is non-flammable, but highly toxic and corrosive. So between ammonia, methyl chloride, and sulfur dioxide, we could actually produce a good refrigerating effect, but it was very dangerous for technicians and even occupants of buildings. Now in 1930, Thomas Midgley, who is both famous or infamous, depending on how you look at his contributions to society, invented R12, which was the first refrigerant that we knew as Freon. R12 was stable, non-flammable, and non-toxic. And it really revolutionized refrigeration and air conditioning. Some other refrigerants that went by the name Freon during that time were R11, and then later on R22. And even today, there are refrigerants that are still under the Freon brand name. But keep in mind, Freon is really a brand. Freon is not one particular refrigerant. Thomas Midgley was a very talented engineer, and unfortunately, he's also known for his work on tetraethyl lead and adding it to gasoline, which was later proven to have significant environmental and health drawbacks. But it's undeniable that Freon, and specifically Freon R12, really changed the game and brought refrigeration, air conditioning, and ice making to a much wider audience across the United States and across the world. In 1974, it was discovered that chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, and hydrofluorocarbons, HCFCs, were depleting the ozone layer, leading to the eventual phase-out of these substances. Nowadays, we talk a lot more about GWP, or global warming potential, and many of these same refrigerants have been studied by scientists and have been shown to have an effect on global warming. Now, quickly, I just want to state that I'm not giving personal opinions here, and I'm not making political stances. I'm just giving a history lesson on why things have occurred the way they do. Over the last 25 years, the dominant refrigerant that we've used in residential and commercial air conditioning in the United States is called R410A, which often went by the brand Puron, although in some cases it was still called Freon. Again, just brand names. But R410A, because it had a high GWP, is now being phased out. And that's where modern A2L refrigerants come in. These are very mildly flammable molecules. The A2Ls that are going to be used in the United States do not contain propane, or A3 type of refrigerants. But propane, also known as R290, is a highly efficient and an environmentally friendly refrigerant, but it's highly flammable. Ammonia is still used in many cases in cold storage, ice rinks, and the like. 
It has amazing thermodynamic properties, but as mentioned before, it is toxic and corrosive. And going back to another refrigerant that was experimented on all the way back at the beginning, CO2, which in its solid form we know is dry ice, is non-toxic, non-flammable, and has a very low GWP, but it operates at higher pressures, and it has some very strange properties, which we know as the triple point and the critical point of a refrigerant, and these numbers are very close together for CO2, making it very odd, which is the reason why dry ice goes straight from solid straight to a vapor when we use it at atmospheric pressure. Again, in our modern world, we're gonna see more and more refrigerants that are flammable, even if just mildly so. And the reason for this is even though we benefited from the stability of the molecules of those old refrigerants like R12 and R22, because of their stability, they can make it up into the upper stratosphere, which can affect our weather. These modern refrigerants have more unstable, more volatile and reactive molecules which means they more readily engage in chemical reactions, generally with oxygen, which increases their flammability. In fact, one of the definitions of flammability is the rapid oxidation of a substance or of matter, meaning that it's highly reactive or highly volatile. So it's a trade-off. More stable molecules, which can potentially affect our atmosphere, or less stable molecules, which are less likely to do so, but more likely to be flammable. All this to say, in our modern world, we often have to make trade-offs. And today we're actually looking once again at some of those earlier refrigerants that pioneered the HVAC and refrigeration trade. As always, trained professionals using proper tools and proper practices are a key to excellent and safe outcomes. Hopefully that explains some of what you're seeing. Hopefully that wasn't too nerdy. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications, available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community, Vortex by Tex.